Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. We may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Michael, Bishop. Bishop in the Church of God, the clergy and people of the Diocese of West Texas, trusting in the guidance of the Holy Spirit, have chosen Jennifer Brooke Davidson to be a bishop and chief pastor. We therefore ask you to lay your hands upon her and in the power of the Holy Spirit to consecrate her a bishop in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Let the testimonials be read. Certificate of Election. This is to certify that at the Council of the Church in the Diocese of West Texas, duly called in accordance with the constitutions and canons of the said diocese, and assembled in the American Bank Center, Corpus Christi, Texas, on February 25th, 2017, the Reverend Jennifer Brooke Davidson, being at least 30 years of age, was duly elected by a constitutional majority consistent with the Constitution and canons of the Diocese of West Texas, and that all requirements of the Constitution of the Episcopal Church have been complied with. In witness whereof, we, the Right Reverend Gary R. Lillibridge, President of the said Council, and the Reverend David G. Reed, Secretary thereof, have hereunto set our hands and caused the seal of the diocese to be affixed this sixth day of March, 2017. Canonical Testimonial of Election. We whose names are here underwritten, fully sensible of how important it is that the sacred order and office of a bishop should not be unworthily conferred, and firmly persuaded that it is our duty to bear testimony on this solemn occasion without partiality, do in the presence of Almighty God, testify that we know of no impediment on the account of which the Reverend Jennifer Brooke Davidson ought not to be ordained to that holy office. We do, moreover, jointly and severally declare that we believe the Reverend Brooke Davidson to have been duly and lawfully elected and to be of such sufficiency in learning and such soundness in the faith and of such godly character as to be able to exercise the office of a bishop to the honor of God and the edifying of the church and to be a wholesome example to the flock of Christ. Executed on March 14th, 2017 by the Reverend David G. Reed, President of the Standing Committee. Certificate of Ordination. This is to certify that according to the Recorder of Ordinations, Jennifer Brooke Davidson was ordained to the diaconate on June 8, 2009 by Bishop Gary Lillibridge at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Wimberley, Texas, and to the priesthood on December 16, 2009 by Bishop Gary Lillibridge at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Wimberley, Texas, submitted by the Church Pension Fund in its capacity as Recorder of Ordinations by Felicia Diaz. Certificate of Consents of Standing Committees. I hereby certify the consents have been received from the standing committees of 74 dioceses 
to the ordination and consecration of Jennifer Brooke Davidson to be Bishop Suffragan of the Diocese of West Texas. Consents of the bishops. Testimonial from the bishops pertaining to the ordination and consecration of the Bishop Suffragan of West Texas. Be it known by all the people of God that 95 bishops, have, being a majority of the bishops having jurisdiction in this church, have consented to the ordination and consecration of Jennifer Brooke Davidson as a bishop in the Church of God and to her status in the House of Bishops as Bishop Suffragan of West Texas, being 1,104th Bishop in the American Succession, signed Diane Ardeen Bruce, Secretary, House of Bishops. My sister, please make your declaration. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I, Jennifer Brooke Davidson, chosen Bishop Suffragan of the Church in West Texas, solemnly declare that I do believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God, and to contain all things necessary to salvation. And I do solemnly engage to conform to the doctrine, discipline, and worship of the Episcopal Church. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, you have heard testimony given that Jennifer Brooke Davidson has been duly and lawfully elected to be a bishop of the Church of God to serve in the Diocese of West Texas. You have been assured of her suitability and that the Church has approved her for this sacred responsibility. Nevertheless, if any of you know any reason why we should not proceed, let it now be made known. Is it your will that we ordain Jennifer a bishop? That is our will. Will you uphold Jennifer as bishop? We will. The scriptures tell us that our Savior Christ spent the whole night in prayer before he chose and sent forth his 12 apostles. Likewise, the apostles prayed before they appointed Matthias to be one of their number. Let us, therefore, follow their examples and offer our prayers to Almighty God before we ordain Jennifer for the work to which we trust the Holy Spirit has called her. God the Father, have mercy on us. God the Son, have mercy on us. Holy 
Trinity, one God. Have mercy on us. We pray to you, Lord Christ. Have Lord, hear our prayer. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love, and be found without fault at the day of your coming, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all members of your church in their vocation and ministry, that they may serve you in a true and godly life, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for and for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be filled with your love, may hunger for truth, and may thirst after righteousness, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Jennifer, chosen bishop in your church, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That she may faithfully fulfill the duties of this ministry, build up your church, and glorify your name. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, she may be sustained and encouraged to preserve to the end. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For her family, that they may be adorned with all Christian virtues. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease, and that all may be one, as you and the Father are one. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who do not yet believe, and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those in positions of public trust, especially Donald, our president, and Greg, our governor, that they may serve justice and promote dignity and freedom of every person. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For a blessing upon all human labor and for the right use of the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For ourselves, for the forgiveness of sins, and for the grace of the Holy Spirit, to amend our lives, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died in the communion of your church, and 
and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To you, O Lord, our God. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines but you shall be called priests of the Lord. You shall be named ministers of our God. You shall enjoy the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you shall glory. Because their shame was double, and dishonor was proclaimed as their lot, therefore they shall possess a double portion. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense and I make an everlasting covenant with them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. El Salmo. Tu amor, Señor, llega hasta los cielos. Tu fidelidad alcanza las nubes. Tu justicia es como las altas montañas. Cuán precioso, oh Dios, es tu gran amor. Todo ser humano haya refugio a la sombra de tus alas. Porque en ti está la fuente de la vida y en tu luz podemos ver la luz. Canten al Señor con alegría, ustedes los justos. Es propio de los íntegros alabar al Señor. Cántenle una canción nueva, toquen con destreza y den voces de alegría. La palabra del Señor es justa, y Él es su todos los hombres. El Señor ama la justicia y el derecho, llena esta tierra de su amor.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. 
As Jesus and his disciples went on their way, Jesus entered a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. In the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. This is a great getting up morning, as they used to say. <laughs> it's a great getting up morning. It really is a joy for me and I know for my brother and sister bishops to come and gather with you, the Diocese of West Texas, for the ordination and consecration of our sister. This is a joyful occasion and it is a joy to bring you the greetings of your brothers and sisters who are the Episcopal Church. They're all here with us. And it is a joy to thank you for the witness of this diocese, your bishop, David Reed, where's David, David? For your bishop and your staff and your clergy and people and the faithful witness to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ of this diocese. And I'm here to thank you. I'm here to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank Jennifer's family. I want to thank you for sharing her with us. And that's a big thanks. You don't have to give her to us. <laughs> but sharing her, and we thank you for that. And I want to thank, I think there's some folks from St. Elizabeth's around here somewhere. Where are they? St. Elizabeth's, where are you? There you are. I want to thank you. We thank you for sharing your beloved priest with us. I listened to her last sermon that she preached at your church. And she said, y'all been doing the impossible. And now you share her with the church so that this wonderful old Episcopal church can do the impossible for God in this world. So I'm glad to be here this morning. I hope you are. It's good to be here. In fact, just turn and tell that neighbor, I'm glad to be here. Just go and tell him. It's good to be here. It is good to be here. It's good to be here. It is. <laughs> now, we got a lot of service left to go, so I'm going to keep this to the point. <laughs> but allow me, if you will, just to offer a word of reflection on the story of Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. 
Every time I hear this story, I think of my grandmother, because my grandmother and her best friend, Clara, my daddy used to call them Mary and Martha. Because <laughs> they would get to fussing about everything in the world. One was a Baptist, the other was a Methodist. <laughs> and they'd get to fussing about church and the Bible and cooking and everything else. And every time I hear this story, I can see both of them now in glory with the original Mary and Martha. <laughs> but Luke writes this in the 10th chapter. Now as Jesus was on his way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Martha had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by many tasks. So she came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left all the work to me? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted about many things. Just one thing is needed. Martha, Martha, Diocese of West Texas. <laughs> Episcopal Church. <laughs> God help us, Anglican Communion. <laughs> you are worried and distracted about many things. Just one thing is needful. And Mary has found out what it is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now allow me just to talk briefly on what's going to sound like a strange subject, but I think it will help to interpret this text. I want to speak for a moment, Jennifer, on the subject, let's brew some coffee. <laughs> yeah, I know. Go, go and tell your neighbor, I think this preacher's crazy. <laughs> Let, let's brew some coffee. This, this story from Scripture, you often wonder, why did the gospel writer tell this story? And, and that's often a good question when you encounter a story that, that, that seems a bit strange and somewhat displaced and may not seem as though it's at home or have any point. But to ask, why did Luke bother to tell this story? On one hand, you do have two sisters, and anybody that's got a sibling, whether brothers or sisters, know that it is the nature of siblings to squabble. In fact, that's in the job description of a sibling, right? <laughs> And so it would be natural that they would be squabbling and their personalities would come to play in whatever it was they were squabbling about. And, and yet, on the other hand, there, it, there was, it seems to me, a legitimate case that Mary was just kind of sitting in the, in the living room, if you will, uh, with Jesus, with the great rabbi and teacher, and, and, and she's just sitting there relaxing and enjoying everything he has to say. And her sister Martha is in the kitchen doing all the work, frying the chicken, which I think we're going to have after service. All right. <laughs> So, so there's a natural reason for some squabbling, but you begin to ask yourself, why did Luke tell this story? What, why did he tell the story of these two sisters and Jesus is not, not a rebuke, but Jesus kind of saying, Martha, you are worried about everything else in the world, everything else. You just need to pay attention to one thing, the main thing, and everything else will take care of itself. It didn't make complete sense to me, I must tell you. It, didn't, it wasn't in seminary when I was studying the writings of the scholars. And it wasn't reading a commentary, brother and sister bishops, reverend clergy, theologians and scholars, people. It wasn't actually reading a Bible commentary. I was actually reading a biography of Howard Schultz called Onward. Howard Schultz, I don't think he was the founder, but he was the lead chief executive officer of Starbucks when Starbucks went big. And in his book, sort of an autobiographical book onward, he tells about Starbucks, y'all know about Starbucks, right? <laughs> And he, he tells about the great growth of Starbucks and how it expanded and, and how it started um, with this incredible vision, um, not just to brew coffee, but that by serving coffee, you could actually create community gathered around the coffee. And, and he said that that was their original reason for being, and that was their original mission um, to, to brew co fine coffee and to create human community gathered around the coffee. And he said Starbucks, as the year went on, Starbucks 
started to grow and the stores proliferated and they were all over the place and then they started to expand the menu and the menu expanded from not just coffee and one or two biscuits or a few things but it expanded to a whole list of things and they were selling cupcakes and cookies and gum and they were selling everything they could think of and they I mean they they were just selling and he said they reached a point at which the growth stopped and they started to decline. Market share got smaller, profit got smaller, and they weren't looking as good as they did on the stock exchange. And they realized something's wrong. Something had gone dreadfully wrong. And they brought in all the consultants to try to work to figure it out. And they brought in all the high price, high power, went to the business schools to get the greatest minds to work on it. But it wasn't until Howard Schultz, can I come out of this for a minute? Well, Howard Schultz, <laughs> he said one day he actually walked into a Starbucks and when he walked in, instead of smelling the smell of brewing coffee, he smelled the smell of baking cheese. And he realized that we had lost our way. We aren't in the cheese business. <laughs> We're in the coffee business. And that's when he went back. And literally, you may remember this, they closed down all the Starbucks for one day. They actually called a Sabbath. They didn't call it that, but that's what they did. <laughs> right? They called a Sabbath and all the baristas had to come and get retrained in the original mission, oh, see, yeah, you'll see where I'm going now. <laughs> Get retrained in the original mission, and when Starbucks reclaimed its actual mission of, of brewing great coffee and creating human community around that coffee, that's when Starbucks really took off. My brothers and sisters, we in the Episcopal Church need to start brewing some good coffee. <laughs> that's what's going on. what I think Jesus was trying to tell Martha. You worrying about everything else on the menu. You worrying about the budget. You worrying about the roof. You worrying about the boiler. Uh, Y'all don't have those problems here in West Texas? <laughs> You're worrying about the church isn't growing fast enough. You're worrying about where are all the young people. You're worrying about the society has gone crazy. Yeah, it's gone crazy, but that's nothing new. <laughs> the truth is, Martha, Martha, West Texas, West Texas Episcopal Church, you're distracted by many things. One thing is needful, and that one thing that is needful is called Jesus. Amen. And and I want to suggest that the reason Luke tells that story was to help that first generation of Christians not to give up or give in or be distracted when hard times come, as they will, but to stay focused on that one thing that is needful. Because focused on that, you can make it. You have incredible focused on that. I, I was, I went back and Jennifer sent me some stuff and I went back and looked at some of her responses to questions that were asked of her and the other nominees for Bishop Suffragan of this diocese. And one of the questions asked, how will you respond to decline in religious church attendance? How will you respond to people no longer being as interested in, in joining religious communities or institutional church? How will you respond to a culture that seems to be moving away from religious organized faith? How will you respond? And you know what this sister said? I assume you did, you elected her. <laughs> 
answer it very succinctly and very clearly. If you read it, I read it and then watched it on the video. She answered, she said, you know something? The key is lighting a fire within by a living relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you light that fire within, other folk are going to see the fire without. And then it will work itself out. Oh, oh, you got it, sister. You got it. And, and, and the truth, the truth is that, that, that she, she's really right. Uh, there, there, there's something about this Jesus. I mean, you know, the brother did know something. There really is. In fact, that's why I've been going around the church talking about we need a new Jesus movement. We need a Jesus movement in the Episcopal Church. We need a Jesus movement in all Christian churches. And I, let me tell you why. Why I really believe we, we need this and why we need this sister right now at this time in our history. I, I am, am an admirer of Pope Francis. I like this brother. I really do. I mean, he doesn't know that, but I do. <laughs> but I have to admit for a while... I was trying, starting to wonder, why is he so popular? I mean, he, he hit, came, and he came to America. He was up and down the East Coast. I mean, in New York City. I mean, folk were getting religion. And let me tell you something. I'm from North Carolina, but in New York City, when folk get religion, something's going on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've got to tell you, I mean, folk were just incredible, ecstatic, all up and down New York, in Philadelphia, in Washington, when Pope Francis came, and it wasn't just a rock star phenomenon. I mean, there's some of that. There was something else going on, and I kept trying to figure out, why is this guy so popular? I mean, he's not saying anything new. Oh. <laughs> he's actually talking about Jesus. Oh. He actually acts like Jesus. I was on my way leaving Raleigh, North Carolina, heading to D Washington, D.C., to, to preach Good Friday service at the National Cathedral, and I stopped at the airport and picked up the newspaper, and it was the Wall Street Journal, and on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, from Monday Thursday, was a picture of Pope Francis washing the feet of immigrants, washing the feet of Muslims, washing the feet. That looks like Jesus to me. And, and I want to suggest we need us some Jesus right now. Amen. And because and, and the truth, and I'm going to get in trouble, but, uh, uh, David, I'll be out of town uh, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we need a Jesus movement in the churches. Um, and I'll tell you why. Part of the reason that Pope Francis is so popular, it doesn't mean you agree with him on everything, but there's something about this guy's spirit that you do resonate. Part of the reason is our culture has often not seen Christians who look something like Jesus. Christians who will love the way Jesus loves, who will give the way Jesus gives, who will forgive the way Jesus, who will do justice and love mercy, walk humbly with our God like Jesus. There, there sometimes, I'm going to get in trouble, but, and I'm not judging anybody, but sometimes Christianity has looked anything like anything like anything else except Jesus. And so when a Christian shows up who actually acts like him, that's news. <laughs> and it may be, it may be that our evangelical vocation as the Episcopal Church is to bear witness to a way of being Christian that actually looks something like Jesus. The Jesus who said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me with, to preach good news to the poor. The Jesus who said, blessed are the poor and the poor in spirit. The Jesus who said, blessed are the merciful, the compassionate. The Jesus who said, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. The Jesus who said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The Jesus who said, you shall love the Lord your God. This is what religion is all about. It's all about, it's not rocket science. It's not complex. It's hard to do. But the Jesus who said, you shall love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself on, on these two hands. 
thing hinged upon all the law and the prophets, that Jesus. Oh, we'd have a different world if we would just love God and love that neighbor. And while you're at it, love yourself. See, see love, I love the Lord. See, my, I had a, my daddy was an Episcopal priest, so I, I learned how to be a good Episcopalian. I loved this church. But grandma was a dyed in the wool Rock Ridge Baptist, North Carolina Baptist. <laughs> and grandma used to talk about Jesus so much, we thought Jesus was the next door neighbor. <laughs> it, it was, but, but, but love the Lord, because God really does love you. And that is not a joke. That is not jive. That is not just a tagline. This God does love you. If, if God didn't love you, why do you think you're here? It's not because you're cute. <laughs> No, this God loves us with a passionate love that called us into being when God didn't even need us. God, because God is God. God doesn't need anything. I mean, think about it. We believe in the God, the Holy Trinity, right? Yeah, right? Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, David, uh, Jennifer, y'all got some work to do if, if we don't get that one. Right. We believe in God, the Holy Trinity. We have how many gods? And we believe this one God to be God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Right, one God, three in one, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. You just passed your performance review, brother. You're in good shape. <laughs> but yeah, and, and St. Augustine of Hippo actually said once that, that what we have in the doctrine of the Holy Trinity is an understanding of this God who is whole and complete in God's self, that this God can embrace individuality and multiplicity, singularity and diversity, that this God is a community of love in God's self, which is a way of saying God's got all the company God needs in God's self, which is another way of saying God don't need y'all. <laughs> Right? And, and truth is, the only reason we exist, the only reason there is a world is because as 1 John chapter 4 verse 7 says, God is love and those who love are born of God and know God because God is love and love makes room for the other. Love makes space for the other. Love says, let Jennifer be. Love says, let David be. Love says, let you, me be. Oh, I love the Lord. Now I'm going to stop now because we got to go. <laughs> and and I, I love the Lord, but I got I to gotta tell you, loving the neighbor is a little bit more work. <laughs> and see, you can't see God, so that's a whole other issue. But the neighbor is a little bit more problematic. Because uh, when you listen to Jesus and there was a lawyer. Oh, you're a lawyer, aren't you? Oh, yeah. And, and, oh, yeah. It was a lawyer who, who came to Jesus. A lawyer has asked a lot of questions. And one lawyer said, I agree with you on this teaching from the Mosaic tradition that you should love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. But it's important. Let us define the word neighbor. <laughs> See, that's where the rubber's meeting the road. And just when Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, which was a parable about somebody he knew that lawyer would not like. Um, which is a way of saying the neighbor is, guess what? Somebody you don't like or somebody you don't agree with, your neighbor is your family? <laughs> your, your neighbor, folk in your church, folk in your neighborhood, and folk all around, your neighbor is everybody you run into. Your neighbor is, if you're a Democrat, your neighbor is a Republican. If you're a Republican, your neighbor is a Democrat. If you're an independent, you can pick as you want. But the truth is, right? <laughs> Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. And implicit in that is love yourself. Oh, you got to love yourself. Let me tell you, if God loved you so much, if God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, if God loves you, how dare you not love yourself? I, I love Michael Curry. <laughs> I do. I get up every morning. Some of the bishops have heard me say this, but that's all right. I get up in the morning. I love myself so good before I've even shaved. I look into the mirror and I look carefully and I say, Denzel Washington, is that you? Oh, you pretty thing, you. <laughs> My, 
I do that, my wife says, get back in bed, you old fool. Get back in bed, you old fool. <laughs> Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two, says Jesus, hang all the law and the prophets. Oh, Martha. Martha, you're distracted by a lot. Just one thing is needful. And this one thing is called Jesus. He can show us the way. Because his way really is the way. And the more we dare to follow his way, the less distracted we will be. Well, let me stop now. One of my favorite sayings, which I've been quoting for years, was a saying attributed to Billy Sunday. Apparently, Billy Sunday was reputed to have said, you all know about Billy Sunday, the great evangelist, 19th, 20th century evangelist, who actually really did kind of create the altar call. I mean, it preexisted him, but he made it popular. Um, and Billy Graham and others kind of picked it up from him. Uh, but anyway, Billy Sunday, great evangelist, uh, great ball player. Um, anyway, and who had an affinity, who liked the Episcopal Church, by the way. Anyway, he'd never been in one, but he liked it. <laughs> anyway, Billy Sunday was a, reputed to have said, and I've now verified, he actually did say it. He said, heaven help the devil if the Episcopal Church ever wakes up. <laughs> I said, well, that's pretty good. I think it's a compliment. I'm not sure. But anyway, it's a, it's a, well, I've been quoting that thing for years, um, and I don't remember where I first heard it, but I found out where it came from. I was in New York at the church club. It used to be called the Churchman's Club, and every presiding bishop has, has gone and, and sort of done a keynote presentation at the Churchman Club. So I was talking about evangelism and, and bringing folk to Christ, and so I happened to quote uh, Billy Sunday and said, you know, where he said, heaven help the devil if the Episcopal Church ever wakes up. And so I quoted it, and that was fine. I went on about my business. Well, Andy Dietschy, the Bishop of New York, uh, pulled me aside afterward. He said, I want you to meet the vicar of one of the congregations here. I said, well, that's fine, Andy. Well, why? He said, well, he's the vicar of the church where Billy Sunday actually said that. I said, really? And so, so we went over and we talked, and he said the story was, apparently Billy Sunday was invited by some Episcopalians to have a revival. And that was such, so shocking, it was actually covered in the New York Times, because <laughs> that was the whole story in itself, to have a revival in an Episcopal church. And um, Billy Sunday was there, but he had never actually been in a church, Episcopal church before, and he sat down. This is before 1928, so it's the predecessor prayer book of the 1928 one. And apparently Billy Sunday asked for some quiet so he could sit down. He sat down in a pew and took out a book of common prayer, and he started to read from the book of common prayer, from what used to be called the service of Holy Communion. Here, O Israel, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He read comfortable words, God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He read the office of instruction. What is my bounden duty as a member of Christ's church to follow Christ? to worship God every Sunday in his church, to work, pray, and give for the spread of the kingdom of God. In reading the book of common prayer, he put the book down and lifted up his head and said, heaven help the devil if the Episcopal church ever wakes up. I don't know about you, but when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is get a cup of coffee. <laughs> Jennifer, we need you to wake us up, to wake up this church and help us brew some coffee, to brew some coffee about a Jesus who loves us, to brew some coffee about a God who loves us, to brew some coffee about a world that is different and better and blessed, to brew some coffee about a world where no child goes to bed hungry, to brew some coffee about a world where there's plenty good room for all of God's children, to brew some coffee of a church that looks like Jesus. Sister, wake us up and brew some coffee. God bless you. God bless you.
My sister, the people have chosen you and have affirmed their trust in you by acclaiming your election. A bishop in God's holy church is called to be one with the apostles in proclaiming Christ's resurrection and interpreting the gospel and to testify to Christ's sovereignty as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. You are called to guard the faith, unity and discipline of the church, to celebrate and to provide for the administration of the sacraments of the new covenant, to ordain priests and deacons, and to join in ordaining bishops, and to be in all things a faithful pastor and wholesome example for the entire flock of Christ. With your fellow bishops, you will share in the leadership of the church throughout the world. Your heritage is the faith of patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and those of every generation who have looked to God in hope. Your joy will be to follow him who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. My sister, are you persuaded that God has called you to the office of bishop? I am so persuaded. Will you accept this call and fulfill this trust in obedience to Christ? I will obey Christ and will serve in his name. Will you be faithful in prayer and in the study of Holy Scripture that you may have the mind of Christ? I will, for he is my help. Will you boldly proclaim and interpret the gospel of Christ, enlightening the minds and stirring up the conscience of your people? I will, in the power of the Spirit. As a chief priest and pastor, will you encourage and support all baptized people in their gifts and ministries, nourish them from the riches of God's grace, pray for them without ceasing, and celebrate with them the sacraments of our redemption. I will, in the name of Christ, the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Will you guard the faith, unity, and discipline of the church? I will, for the love of God. Will you share with your fellow bishops in the government of the whole church? Will you sustain your fellow presbyters and take counsel with them? Will you guide and strengthen the deacons and all others who minister in the church? I will, by the grace given me. Will you be merciful to all, show compassion to the poor and strangers, and defend those who have no helper? I will, for the sake of Christ Jesus. Jennifer, through these promises, you have committed yourself to God to serve his church in the office of bishop. We therefore call upon you, chosen to be a guardian of the church's faith, to lead us in confessing that faith. We believe in one God. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, He is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for 
for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies and God of all comfort, dwelling on high but having regard for the lowly, knowing all things before they come to pass, we give you thanks that from the beginning you have gathered and prepared a people to be heirs of the covenant of Abraham, and have raised up prophets, kings, and priests, never leaving your temple unattended. We praise you also that from the creation you have graciously accepted the ministry of those whom you have chosen. Therefore, Father, make Jennifer a bishop in your church. Pour out upon her the power of your princely spirit whom you bestowed upon your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, with whom he endowed the apostles, and by whom your church is built up in every place to the glory and unceasing praise of your name. To you, O Father, all hearts are open. We pray that the heart of this your servant whom you have chosen to be bishop in your church will be filled with such love of you and of all the people that she may feed and tend the flock of Christ and exercise without reproach the high priesthood to which you have called her, serving before you day and night in the ministry of reconciliation, declaring pardon in your name, offering the holy gifts, and wisely overseeing the work and work life of the church. In all things, May she present before you the acceptable offering of a pure and gentle and holy life, 
through Jesus Christ, your Son, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and power and glory in the church now and forever. Amen. Amen. Receive these vestments as a symbol of the whole armor of God. Clothe yourself with Christ, remembering that there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, as we are all one in Christ Jesus. Receive this cross as a sign of our Lord's triumph and our salvation. Proclaiming Christ's resurrection and his sovereignty as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Receive this ring as a symbol of authority. Remembering that you are a servant of Christ, guard the faith and discipline of Christ holy and Catholic Church. Recalling to all the unity we share as members of Christ's body. Receive this stole as a symbol of the sacramental ministry to which you are called. Share the riches of Christ's grace with young and old, strong and weak, rich and poor. Receive this staff used for 21 years by Bishop Bob Hibbs as a sign of the shepherd's calling. Lead and guide those given to your care. Seek the lost. Encourage and tend the hurting. Never give up. I'm not done yet in all things. Be a faithful pastor, reminding the flock of our one true shepherd, Jesus Christ. Receive the Holy Scriptures, feed the flock of Christ committed to your charge, guard and defend them in his truth, and be a faithful steward of God's holy word and sacraments. My brothers and sisters of the Diocese of West Texas, greet your new bishop and her family. <laughs> Always with you. And also with you. <laughs> Peace be with you, dear. Peace, brother. Thank you, man. <laughs> you be great. Lord, peace be with you, sister. Oh, God bless. Thank you.
Peace be with you, Miss Bola Boss. <laughs> oh, peace. Right, love you, brother. Oh, yeah. Hey, brother. Peace be with you, brother. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Peace be with you, brother. Great to be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. I know, it's good. Because I'm finished now. So, yeah, I'm done. Peace be with you. Congratulations on ordination. Newly ordained. Yeah. Newly ordained. It's wonderful. I love you, man. Enjoy the rest of that vacation. You may be seated. Oh, my you. Peace, dear brother. God bless you, man. Please be seated. Please be seated. Peace be with you. Wonderful. Oh, God bless you, brother. You're welcome. Oh, peace be with you. So good to be with you. I haven't been surrounded by so much purple since I was at an Earth, Wind, and Fire concert in 1968. <laughs> what did he say? It's great to be with all of you, and we at Christ Church welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What a great day. Can you agree it's a great day? Don't you wish that Bishop Curry could bring the word? Whoa! Come on, baby! Woo. All right, I want to just give you a few instructions. Uh, first of all, at Holy Eucharist today, uh, in this building, uh, we will, you'll come up this way. The ushers will tell you when it's time. You'll either come to the main altar or the two altars, either in the Capers Chapel or in the Bishop's Chapel. Uh, those in the overflow, I hope you can see me on the screen. Uh, Bishop Curry and Bishop Brooke Davidson will be bringing your communion, so you get the special, you get the special feeding today. Uh, yeah. Now, those uh, folks that are in the over overflow in the carriage house, please go to the parish hall to receive there. Uh, but everyone will be fed. Now, lunch may be another matter. Um, <laughs> We uh, have 470 meals out there. Uh, I ask you please just to take one plate because we're charged by the plate. Actually, I don't care that much because I'm sending the bill to David. But, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, but uh, there's chicken and all sorts of trimmings and there's pies that people all over the diocese have made and we want you to please have a nice repast. Those in the parish hall, if you're able, please bring your chairs out to the table, so we'll have about, oh, I don't know, about 200 seats outside. We'll have about 100 seats in the carriage house where it's air conditioned. And if the heat is just too oppressive, you can go in the parish hall and just sit in a seat. Eventually, however, do go home. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, I am just, uh, the people of Christ Church are so delighted to be your host today. Um, I didn't accept uh, Bishop uh, Reed's request until I came back to our staff and asked them if they would like to do this. Now you have to understand, the average tenure at Christ Episcopal Church amongst our staff is over 12 years. And when I asked, would you guys want to do this, our senior sexton's been serving this church since uh, for 31 years. He got on his feet, Robert Veo, and he says, you bet we've arrived. <laughs> And that's the attitude that we've had here. And I thank the choir, I thank the altar guild, I think the entire vestry is here to be act as, as shepherds and to find, help you find your way. So many folks have been so gracious, and uh, it's all of them. Scott Kitayama, chief of staff, he organized the entire thing. Scott, we thank you for your work. Um, just uh, two other things, uh, three other things. Um, today, I have to tell you about a private, private moment I had with Bishop Curry. I took his hand because yesterday I was so moved by his presence. I mean, if you round him at any, time, any, any length of time, there's something about him. I took his hand and I said, Bishop, I thank you for your kindness and your humility. I mean, he is uh, uh, inutterably and wonderfully kind. And he's so humble, always giving the credit to somebody else. And I said, Bishop, thank you for lifting up Jesus, because that's what we need. Can you, can you say amen to that? Amen. And then yesterday, the newspaper called me 
<laughs> yeah, I love that. The newspaper called me and asked me about Jennifer Brooke Davidson, my sister of about 15 years, and, and they said, well, uh, tell us, uh, uh, Rector Gahan, uh, was she elected because she's a woman? And I, <laughs> and I said, well, I, I, I know I don't think that's the reason. And they said, well, well, why, why was she elected? I said, she was elected because she believes that Jesus transforms individuals, he transforms families, and he transforms congregations. That's why she was elected, and that's what she'll bring to us. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. That's what it's about. <laughs> so praise God for that. The offering today, speaking of Jennifer Davidson, uh, will all go to her, to Haiti, I mean her, um, her um, discretionary fund. Uh, so, Bishop Reed, do you have anything to add to that? You've said everything I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> you asked me to host this thing. Uh, Jennifer, the... <laughs> Off to our sentences. You Don't it. stumble over your cane. <laughs> oh, yes. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts. There's something, yeah. something's tied up under. Oh, it's the cord. If, I know, I'm working on it. it. <laughs> it's a real vibe. Yeah, thank you. A friend of mine called it a vampire killing vibe. Okay. Are we moving here?
shall wipe your tears away, and death shall be no more. Death shall be. with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through the great shepherd of your flock, Jesus Christ our Lord, who after his resurrection sent forth his apostles 
to preach the gospel and to teach all nations and promise to be with them always, even to the end of the ages. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is dying. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Oh.
Dios, Padre Todopoderoso, te damos gracias porque nos has nutrido con el santo alimento del cuerpo y sangre de tu Hijo y nos unes por medio de Él en la comunión de tu Santo Espíritu. Te damos gracias porque levantas entre nosotros siervos fieles para el ministerio de tu palabra y sacramento. Te suplicamos que Jennifer sea para nosotros un ejemplo eficaz en palabra y obra, en amor y paciencia y en santidad de vida. Concede que junto con ella te sirvamos ahora y que siempre nos gocemos en tu gloria por Jesucristo tu Hijo, nuestro Señor, que vive y reina contigo y el Espíritu Santo, un solo Dios, ahora y por siempre. Amén. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The blessing, mercy, and grace of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Thank you.